so today we have 18 new cases of COVID-19 to report. This comprises 14 new confirmed cases and four probable cases. There are no additional deaths to report, so the total number of deaths remains at four. There are now 471 reported cases of COVID-19 where the people have recovered from their infection. This is an increase of 49 on yesterday. As you will see then, we continue to report more recovered cases than we do new cases. The new total of combined and probable cases in New Zealand is 1,330. Today there are 14 people in hospital, one each in Wellington, Middlemore, Wairo in Blenheim, Dunedin and North Shore hospitals. One of these patients in ICU, of the total of five in ICU, uh, are uh, in uh, a critical condition. So the 14 people in hospital, five in ICU, one of whom is in a critical condition in Dunedin. For the cases we have information on, uh, the strongest link is with those uh, who are contacts of existing cases, that's 47%, uh, while 40% are linked to overseas travel. 2% uh, are confirmed as community transmission, while 11% are still under investigation. That's a reduction from 18% a week ago. In terms of testing yesterday, it was a quieter day, I think reflecting the Easter break, uh, and 2,421 tests were processed. The seven-day rolling average is now 3,523, and the total number of tests undertaken is 61,000. 167, and we will of course include those updated figures on our website. Just want to comment on aged residential care as a key setting. We currently have three significant COVID-19 clusters in aged residential care facilities. Two are in Christchurch and one in the Waikato. Now we know from international reports uh, and of course our experience here with the three deaths over the last uh, three days sadly, uh, with the deaths over the last three days, that this is a group that is particularly vulnerable to a poor outcome if they do get infected with this virus. We are pro prioritising a range of actions around this and the DHBs and the Ministry have worked very closely with aged residential care providers and their umbrella groups right since early on in this outbreak. Very early on in the piece I sent a message to aged residential care facilities, even before we uh, had a, very many cases in New Zealand, to prevent anyone coming in, both staff and visitors, who may have any symptoms of a respiratory illness. And likewise, very soon after that, we advised them to restrict visitors. In fact, stop any visitors other than those that were for compassionate reasons. Yesterday, uh, to supplement this, I wrote to all district health board chief executives again, asking them to systematically assess the readiness of all age residential care providers in their area and to provide support and assistance as necessary. So the DHBs will look at each facility's plans and procedures to ensure that they are reducing any risk to residents and staff. And this will include uh, assessing PPE stocks uh, how it is being used, and also to ensure that there is a ready supply of PPE for those facilities. We've produced uh, very clear guidance and updated that uh, yesterday on uh, the measures that resident, uh, these facilities need to have in place to protect staff and residents. And most important here, of course, is that any staff who are unwell, even with any mild symptoms, or who have maybe a uh, close contact of an existing or probable case, do not come to work. Uh, and the, the units must have in place very clear policies and procedures for how they treat any possible or suspected cases. So uh, there are a number of steps underway to continue to work very closely with our age residential care sector to ensure that we are keeping both the residents and of course staff safe there. In terms of the Rosewood uh, residents who are currently at Burwood Hospital, uh, there was a question asked yesterday about this and in particular why they're not treated as hospital admissions. So the Rosewood residents were transferred to Burwood uh, last week from what we would call a high level 
psychogeriatric or dementia care unit. The care they are receiving is consistent with that high level of care they would have received if they had remained at Rosewood and includes, where appropriate, end of life and palliative care. It's true that they are indeed now in Burwood being cared for by DHB uh, nursing, healthcare assistants and other staff, but as would occur in the unit that they came from, the medical care is overseen by the GP uh, even while they are in Burwood. So the care that has been provided is not uh, medical care per se, just because they happen to be in a hospital setting, it is the care and support they were receiving that when they were at Rosewood. Just an update on clusters, we consider, continue to keep a very close eye on our 13 current clusters and we recognise the significant public interest in the management of them. Just uh, uh, some clarity around one of the clusters yesterday that was named as uh, being related to Spectrum Care and I know there have been, has been concern from people who receive services from Spectrum Care and I want to reassure you that there is no need for concern there. The current cluster has 28 confirmed probable cases and as the Director of Public Health, uh, Caroline McElnay, mentioned yesterday, these originated in the community and subsequently led to an infection of a person linked to Spectrum Care. However, it's not a cluster that had its origin within the Spectrum Care facility. A small number of the cases, though, are related to that, uh, to Spectrum Care and work there, in this case, five. All the positive results attributed to this cluster are cases other cases are in the community uh, and include household and other close contacts. And I can say that the Spectrum Care staff have followed all appropriate actions, including self-isolating staff while they recover and are working closely with the public health unit up there, Auckland Regional Public Health. And a couple of comments to finish on, and I've said this uh, each day for the last week, it's very important people seek timely care for their health care needs. Uh, we have seen and you've seen stories of a drop off in emergency department presentations and I've just had the latest report from Healthline showing that many people who are calling have uh, got quite serious symptoms when they do call. People should not be either afraid of uh, seeking care nor should they delay doing that. Um, emergency departments, doctors, surgeries, after hours facilities all have in place very clear processes to separate out people who might have respiratory symptoms and might be being investigated or subsequently investigated for suspected COVID-19 from others who are seeking other care for other conditions. So people should not delay seeking care. They should ring Healthline, get advice. They should ring their regular GP. And likewise, anybody who has respiratory symptoms and feels they need uh, or should be getting a, a, a test should seek advice either through Healthline or through calling their own GP and they will be giving advi given advice about where to get swabbing done at their lo local community-based assessment centre. Finally, a message uh, around Easter. As I said earlier, and as you will all know, it's Easter Sunday, so think particularly about older friends and whānau. Uh, we know Easter can be a hard time for a lot of people who may not be around friends or family at a time when we are usually uh, very close to our friends and family. So if you can this Easter Sunday do, Sunday, do reach out across the generations, call or virtualise your messages to family and friends. I know many people will be doing that and I thank you and encourage you to do that. Uh, this is a collective effort and uh, we will get through this if we continue to support each other. So kia ora, thank you again and I'm happy to take questions. You just Give us an that on the to GPs, uh, saying to people, look, still go to your GP if you're not well. You've repeated that message to us a few times mm. here, but do you think you, it took you too long to keep saying that message? Are people ignoring that and, and are you comfortable that that message is getting across to people? I think the message is getting across through a range of channels and we've seen uh, the report, other reports about ED attendance has been down. As soon as we got a, a hint that this was happening uh, over a week ago, we started to um, press it home very clearly every day. And likewise, DHBs, GPs, the College of GPs and others are uh, emphasising that message. There is capacity on Healthline to attend to everybody's health needs. The wait times are... Uh, tiny now, the, the median time to pick up a call is under 10 seconds, so we need people to keep using Healthline, keep using and calling their GP, who may be able to provide advice over the phone, uh, and that will be important. Should you have been giving that message earlier on, because it is a bit confusing, stay home on one side, but 
if you're sick. Do you think that message should have been spelt out more clearly from the beginning? Well, from the beginning, we've also always said that uh, accessing healthcare whether it's at a GP or at a hospital or some other healthcare, is an essential service. And it's one of the very few reasons right from the start of Alert Level 4 we have been encouraging people to uh, seek that. And that's a, a, a bona fide reason for being out and about, is seeking healthcare. And again, just emphasising that. Would you expect to hear back from the DHBs around, about the aged care review and will that information be made public? So it's not so much a review. I have just asked them to, as part of their ongoing work with age residential care, to get teams out there to actually um, engage with and visit each facility and include in that team both clinical and infection prevention and control expertise so they can basically support these facilities in their work, identify any support and needs they may have and address those. So they won't be reporting back to you? Uh, well, I'll be asking them for an update and I'll be happy to just you know, um, reflect on that and, and progress with that work. Can you update us on the um, New Zealanders returning from the Greg Mortimer um, cruise ship today? Are any of them unwell and what exactly will happen to them um, when they get back? So what I can say is that 13 of the 16 New Zealanders uh, will be uh, arriving and brought into Auckland. Uh, I understand that none of those people are unwell enough to require hospital level care, so they will be going into an isolation facility. Because they're coming out of a situation where there was very high level of infection and we're considering it high risk, they will all be treated uh, as if they are high risk and we will be testing them all and then they will be in a quarantine facility for the 14 days regardless of the outcome of the tests. Dr Bloomfield, do you have any information on the George Manny and Rosewood clusters, the source of that, those classes? Uh, I don't have any further information and that, uh, that investigation is ongoing. What we tend to find, and because uh, over the last few weeks there haven't been visitors coming into these facilities, the, mo the most likely source of introduction is through a staff member, but we, that hasn't been confirmed in either of those two clusters as yet. But as soon as we do have that information, we'll provide it. What are the risks of moving yeah. residents from Rosewood and, and how many more can we expect to be moved over the next week or so? So uh, at the moment, uh, there is no plans to move more of them to be looked after in the Burwood setting, uh, the Burwood hospital setting. What I can say though is, and, and Dr. McElnay flagged this yesterday, that you know these are people who are older, they are frail, they ha have high care needs, and there is a number of them with COVID-19 infection, and we may well see further deaths over coming days. I think I'm, you know, just to be honest with, with you about that, um, we're not, we're, not, we're continuing not to not treat them as hospital admissions. These are people who are receiving exactly the same care and support they would have if they had been at Rosewood. It's just a facility that is better able to look after them at the moment, particularly because a number of staff members at Rosewood were affected and they were having they would have had trouble uh, staffing the unit to continue to look after these people. Would you consider something like testing um, all staff members and, and people having, coming into contact with them? Is that something that you'd look at? You mean in age residential just care? Just in age residential care, yeah. Yeah, so um, there's been some publicity about um, um, uh, the age residential care sector looking for routine testing of any new resident coming in. About 700 new, uh, new people are admitted to age residential care each week. Um, our view is that um, uh, testing is it would be one of a number of things you can do, particularly if anyone's symptomatic. So yes, test anyone symptomatic and all new residents are required to go into a 14-day isolation period. However, testing is, is of appropriate testing is just one part of how to keep both residents and staff safe, and clearly uh, good infection prevention control, access to and appropriate use of PPE um, and so on are, are the mainstays really, and, and excellent hygiene and cleaning in those facilities. We've been working with the sector really closely and will continue to do so. Um, what I would say though is that in that setting, uh, if we do get cases, as we have in a number of um, facilities, we may then test asymptomatic people, as we have in some other healthcare settings, uh, just to get a picture if we're not clear about what the direction of the infection is. So what, would be the, what would prompt that? It's, an, it's, an, it's a, a judgment and assessment by the, the local medical officer of health who is, a, who is a, very aware of what the situation is on the ground and whether it's clear what the source of infection is, what the likely spread is, and how many close contacts there are. So just to be clear, you're saying no symptomatic, no, no systematic testing in aged care facilities, that's off the cards, but possible around clusters of the virus. Why not do that in 
with, with Rosewood residents and staff outside of the dementia unit? There may well be testing happening, appropriate testing there. Uh, I don't have the details on that. But again, it's a judgment. It's actually a judgment for the local medical officer of health. So we've had the example down in Queenstown at Lakes Hospital I've talked about where they found a staff member with infection and then they tested around 30 other staff who were asymptomatic. They found another one and then extended it to the full around 70 staff and, and found have subsequently found, I think, one further people, person infected. So it's a judgment of the medical officer of health and they will know when it is appropriate to use uh, wider testing. You'll recall we also did this very early on with the case in a Dunedin school where we, uh, where a, a several, I think several hundred or well over a hundred uh, students were tested because we wanted to be confident we knew what the, the, the origin of that infection was. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, what, are grounds, what are the grounds for not having more details about the Auckland party cluster given that so we were able to report about the bluff wedding whereas this yeah. one's very much kept under wraps. So the Bluff Wedding uh, was an event at a place from people who had come from all around the country and some who had flown in from overseas and it affected not just those who attended the event but also uh, there were also the potential to have affected staff there. This was a private, my understanding is this was a private uh, event and um, we'll, uh, I'll, we'll keep reviewing it. Um, we're, we've been very um, keen to be as open as possible but at the moment it's a private event and there's no particular, all the people who are associated with it have been identified uh, and put into self-isolation and anyone who becomes symptomatic has been, um, uh, is being tested. So there's no sense that there would be a, the risk of wider transmission beyond the people who were at that event and close contacts. Isn't there such a heightened public interest around this though that, that perhaps it is an exceptional circumstance and even if it is a private event, the public interest is so high? Yes, I think that's that's certainly a perspective that you could put on this. I think uh, at this point in time, it's a it's a well bounded private event, and uh, we're we're comfortable with ensuring, of course, that we keep identifying that that is a cluster and it providing an update on any additional cases each day. Yeah, spectrum, for example. Yes, and actually, um, that. Uh, that is probably better described as a community cluster. That includes some people who work at Spectrum Care, so it's not actually a workplace-based cluster. It just involves folk working at Spectrum Care. What about the cluster um, associated with the person in Wellington who died on Friday? Yes. So what I can say about that is that, uh, just to be clear, that the person who died on Friday uh, became infected as part of the Bluff Wedding event. Right, and was treated in Wellington. That's right, yes. The Aged Care Association uh, says there was criticism from public health of staff not working in designated zones. What concerns did you have around that? Was that at a specific facility? It was, I think it was just a general letter across um, from the Aged Care Association. So could you just repeat the quote from the letter? Um, so the Aged Care Association says there was criticism from public health of staff not working in designated zones. Um, I just don't feel I can comment further on that, perhaps without understanding the context. Context. It was a letter to me. I'll meet you after that. Okay, thank you very much. A few specific cases. Sure. Um, the supermarket worker in Flaxmere. Yes. Uh, I understand that he lives in a house with nine other people. Has any yes. proactive action been taken around them, pro proactive contact tracing, for example? Yes, very active. And um, that person, uh, it's very clear that the person didn't uh, get the infection in their workplace. And it's been very carefully, carefully and closely managed by the local public health unit. My team have spoken with the medical officer of health, uh, who has a very good understanding of what the, where the origin of the infection was, who the close contacts are, and all the appropriate action is in place there. What was the origin? Uh, my understanding is that the, that it was uh, the, the the index case there had travelled to another place and it might have been Queenstown and uh, that's where the infection was uh, was from. And in Waikato DHB, where the nurses contracted COVID, um, how many patients are considered contacts of those nurses? Uh, my understanding is it's the patients who were on in that uh, ward uh, at the time the nurses were working there, and there's no evidence to suggest that any of those. Uh, when I last heard that the, any of the people on the ward, the, the, the patients on the ward, are infected. Um, and so it seems that the staff had got the infection from outside of the workplace. Do you have an update on how many staff have are stood down still? Uh, I don't on the staff that have stood down. I do know that there are now three cases associated with that and I understand that they are all staff members.
Dr. Can Lufen, I go we're, hearing from, um, okay. we're hearing from uh, care workers across many DHBs that they still have very little or no access to PPE despite the announcement on uh, March 31 that they would be able to access it. Why is this still happening? I, what I am confident in is that DHBs have PPE, that they have good policies in place, and that they are ensuring that staff that need access to PPE in their work are getting it. And that's the reports I'm getting from many staff from across the sector, and you will also see media reports about uh, that there is very good and access to appropriate PPE for when it is required. Can I just go back to the, um, the, the stock take, if you like, that you're doing with DHBs? Do you feel like that should have been done right at the beginning? We always knew they were a vulnerable group. Why now? Well, we've worked really closely with this sector right from the start, from very early on. I think I've had a team in the ministry focused just on this, and the DHBs have been very focused. Uh, it's not so much a why now. It's I'm, What I'm letting you know is we're doing this as an additional measure, partly because um, we've got the, 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 the outbreaks in several facilities, but also as we think about ha getting out of uh, alert level four, we want to be really sure that these settings are watertight to be able to um, protect staff and residents. And one of the ways to ensure, to, to satisfy ourselves of that is to make sure that the right people have gone in and just tested. Because what we have found is with the clusters that have broken out, that there, there were some deficiencies in the, in the actual procedures and how those were being implemented. And we want to make sure that every facility's got really good plans, procedures, access to PPE and knows how to use it. Can you give us some examples of where it wasn't working? I don't have specific examples. Around PPE and, and things like yeah, that, or people coming yeah, in Yeah, about, uh, so about, again, and this has always been a, a key point around uh, PPE, it's, it's not straightforward to use, and people have to be taught how to use it properly. Even just a, uh, using a face mask, a simple surgical face mask, uh, has to be done properly. So that's part of the uh, action now, is to just make sure. And we do know many, many of these facilities have got excellent procedures and policies and the staff are trained. We just want to reassure ourselves, particularly as we contemplate uh, moving down alert levels. You know, no deficiencies. I mean, you know, the, the source of the Rosewood cluster is still unknown, correct? Uh, so uh, it's not just deficiencies in helping protect um, it, what needs to, is important is helping protect staff and residents from any infection in the first place. It's then what happens once there is an infection to prevent further spread, both to residents and staff. And that requires really, really good policies and procedures that need to be tried and, and tested. And that's what I'm asking the DHB staff to get out there and make sure all, all facilities are on top of that. Um, apologies if I've missed it, but um, did you say that you'd changed the guidance to care workers about PPE recently? And no, we updated the general advice to age residential care just yesterday, just to update that uh, in light of again what we're learning as we go through this um, through this situation. And so, are you looking to update guidance on PPE for care workers at all? Uh, the, the current guidance stands. Yes. Something just a little bit different. We've seen um, really, really small versions of weddings going ahead, where it's just the the, the you know the couple and, and the celebrant as well. Should weddings like that still be going ahead during lockdown, um, or sorry, level four? Well, I guess if the celebrant is from the bubble of those people, then yes. Uh, if not, then I think it's questionable. Should they still uh, be allowed? Although it could be done, being done virtually, of course. In person, so they're in person, same location, different bubble. Should they still be allowed to issue, you know, you know, licences and you know, um, hold these ceremonies? Well, they may be doing that in a way that isn't creating any ov um, any overlapping of their bubbles. Uh, I don't have it's hard to comment without any detail um, and uh, uh, but I, but I think people have a really good understanding of what what is what they need to do to help protect themselves and those in their bubble and I assume they're keeping their maintaining the integrity of the of the bubbles if not I'm happy to look at any specific examples in Uruguay, some schools uh, um, could be looking to go back on April 29 do you have concerns? of high-risk workers in those environments or how are you working with the education uh, area on how to safely protect the students and teachers? Well, I do know the uh, Ministry of Education and the sector is doing a huge amount of work to look at um, how education can be uh, delivered to, right across the spectrum from early childhood education through to tertiary education 
once we step down out of uh, alert level four um, and further. Uh, and I can't comment on that work. I know it's ongoing, but that um, will be the, the primary consideration will be ensuring that both the students and, of course, the folk working there are safe. On um, contact tracing, uh, Google and Apple have announced that they'll, um, they're looking to implement some measures. Is that something that the government's looking at? Uh, we're looking at their specific initiative, which, um, from my understanding, is about using this uh, method of having devices connect via Bluetooth to be able to recall uh, information around proximity. Now, this is the approach that Singapore has been using, and we've, well, I think you heard the PM the other day talk about that she would conversed directly with the Prime Minister of Singapore about the approach they're using there, a specific app. So yes, we're following and we've actually talked with, um, or my team have talked with the, the local Google and Apple folk about the work they're doing. That won't be available till mid-May and we're hoping to get some sort of um, app up sooner than that that would be able to provide information that, that would support our contact tracing. Did you get back on education? The Health Minister, uh, Education Minister today said, um, look, we can't give any firm indication of what schools were open because we're waiting on public health advice. What is that advice that they're waiting on and when will it come? Uh, well, we're providing advice right across government about if we were to move to Alert Level 3 or when we move to Alert Level 3, what are the sorts of um, things you would need to have in place to help ensure that we were minimising the risk of, of community spread and community outbreaks? So that's around physical distancing, hygiene, cleaning and so on. So each sector then takes that advice and translates that into what that might mean for um, either their business, for their school, for um, other settings, uh, including, for example, in the hospitality sector, what's possible within those parameters. So, look, there's a lot of active work happening, uh, and uh, that work, that advice is going not just to education, but to all governments, etc. So it's a specific set of advice, you know. It's not, it's not, it's, you know, at what point do you imagine that you will be able to provide the advice that the education um, ministry will be able to make decisions? Well, we've provided some initial advice and we'll continue to provide advice. So that, that work is happening apace because all of this will go into informing the government's decision, of course, uh, about uh, when uh, to step, step down from Alert Level 4. So the advice is ongoing. We're working closely with education and uh, all of our other government colleagues. Do you have an update, on the, you have an update sorry, on the compliance on Easter weekend, just with lockdown rules, how people have been complying? Uh, can I? So I'm just having a look at the all of government information. I look. I don't have information on the compliance. I can say that that the total number of breaches now is um, wait 847, and 109 prosecutions have been have flowed from that. 717 warnings and 21 youth referrals. But I don't have a further breakdown on. Particularly, I know the police has been have been very active uh, over the Easter weekend. Um, uh, stopping cars and also high presence in the community. On that Uruguay flight that's coming in, can you give us some advice on what kind of quarantine those people will go into? Yes, <clears throat> so they'll be treated as if they are um, as if they are COVID nineteen cases. Uh, so they'll go into our sort of uh, highest level quarantine facility, which is for the people who come off flights and who are symptomatic. So they'll all be tested and they'll all remain in, in that quarantine for the full 14 days. And that's in an Auckland hotel? That's in an Auckland hotel, Quite yes. close to the airport, is that how Correct. it works? Mm -hmm. And they're transported there by a, by a bus. Can you just explain yes. a little bit of the logistics? Yeah, the logistics are similar to what we did for the folk who came in from Wuhan. So it's all a very carefully managed, uh, stage managed process to reduce the risk to uh, others when, um, right from when they land and then they're taken through in, into there. And then, of course, the testing and assessment is done um, uh, when they arrive and, uh, and then, of course, they're looked after very well once they're there. Can you give assurances to the public that, that people like this real care is taken when they land? Oh, yes, I can. Uh, and, of course, this is what we've been doing for some weeks now. We, we tested it and did it uh, when that very first flight came out of Wuhan. And this is what's being done now with uh, any flight that's coming in from overseas with people uh, and anyone who has got symptoms. Re recalling that the number of people coming in just on regular flights now is quite low. I just had the number here. So 257 arrived yesterday. Um, we've got the 13 coming in on this flight and they'll be uh, it's a it's a special aeromedical evacuation flight, so there'll be a special team that'll work with those people to get them through the 
uh, customs and biosecurity and then off to where, and then assessment and then off to where they'll be looked after for the 14 days. Just back on that um, letter from um, before, I've just been sent um, just a little bit more information on that. So I understand it's a, a letter from Aged Care um, Association out to um, providers. It says here, there have been criticism from public health infection control specialists about staff not working solely within their designated areas. Um, are you aware of that criticism? Uh, well, not specifically, but as I said earlier on, what we have found uh, when we have gone into investigate, or, or public health staff have gone into investigate the clusters, that there have been some deficiencies in the policies and procedures, and that may well be what is reflecting and been reflected in the letter. I suspect the the, the association is then um, encouraging its members to make sure that their policies and procedures are um, watertight, and that they will also have the support of district health boards who will be going around and working with them to do that. Perhaps one more question. It's uh, just a number, a general question, around 18 new cases that must be uh, encouraging to continue on that trend. It is encouraging, clearly, and uh, what we'll be wanting to see over coming days is uh, uh, an increase in the testing numbers again uh, after the sort of quiet period over Easter. We want to be doing more testing to find out uh, if there are any cases out there and particularly any evidence of community transmission that we're not yet aware of. Our technical advisory group has a uh, has a subgroup, an epidemiology subgroup, uh, that met on Good Friday to look at the laboratory testing data by uh, with the regional analysis and to provide us with advice around any regions where we might want to increase the testing for a period to just again look and make sure we are not missing cases out there. So that will be happening over the coming week or two. Uh, so um, yes, it's encouraging that we are seeing a smaller number of cases and that. I think uh, all New Zealanders should take heart from that, that our uh, collective efforts are, are paying dividends. Final question. The increase in testing, and where, where, where do you imagine that would be happening, and is that, is that the surveillance testing effectively? Yes, well, the high level of testing we're doing is informing, is effectively both diagnostic and some surveillance testing because there are clearly, um, with a uh, positivity rate now below 2%, most of the tests are negative and uh, we want to maintain that high level of testing. I'll give you an example. Whanganui, um, you might have seen as a DHB region, has got had quite a low number of tests done. And I had a, a, a text conversation with the chief exec there yesterday and said, um, over this next week or so, just get be, be more liberal with the testing, get anyone in who might have symptoms of an inf uh, influenza-like illness or respiratory illness and do some more testing just to make sure that, that there are no um, no cases out there that we might be missing. So that's an example. So you're not saying broaden, broaden the case definition for, for this area per se, you're just saying tell your, tell your, your GPs to be more like, liberal with within the existing bounds. Yeah, I think the case definition is already very broad and uh, here it would be just, you know, it might be instead of, um, uh, uh, you know, so it's encouraging people to go for testing, so uh, having a low threshold for a period of time and sending people for testing uh, and it may be complemented with some testing as well in general practice where people come in with mild illness, they could do the swabs or send them to the, the, the community-based assessment centre for swabbing. Or groups that you might focus on? Well, at the moment, we've seen quite good um, uh, distribution by ethnicity, uh, but we, we'll, I'll look and see what the advice was from the subgroup. I haven't seen that yet, uh, but in particular, we're looking at regional differences in testing rates and also adjusting for um, perhaps clusters that might be there. It may be if you've got, for example, the, the Bluff cluster would increase the positivity rate um, in, in the southern region because you know you are actually likely to find... Um, likely to find cases. So you may want to do, even though they've done quite a lot of testing down there, you might want to do more testing to get the positivity rate down below. At the moment it's 3%. I, I think we should be looking at least over this week, uh, last week and this week, for it to be down closer to 1%, so well below the 2% level. Sorry, just one more question. Sure. So in the last few days, um, has the advice to aged care facilities on um, PPE changed at all in light of the new... No, the advice stands in terms of uh, the appropriate use of it, and I guess the the advice is to make sure it is being used appropriately as part of the the range of infection prevention and control procedures they've got in place. So, the advice um, for aged residential care, uh, which is on our our website, is what was advised. Just generally, 
just re-emphasising the, the key things about staff not coming to work if they're unwell. Anyone with a suspected or probable or confirmed infection should be immediately isolated. Uh, clear um, messages around um, infection prevention control processes. So that's the advice that's been updated just yesterday. What, what reassurance can you give? We're receiving a, lot of, a fair bit of correspondence from, fam from people who have, um, who have older relatives in rest homes in Christchurch that are worried that the spread of Rosewood residents will have come to their rest homes. What reassurance can you give around the, ro the moving Rosewood residents being insulated from other rest home residents? Uh, so I think you might have seen the pictures in the paper that all those residents, uh, when the DHB started working with the rest home, all of those ones who were transferred to Burwood were transferred by hospital with very strict um, uh, you know, use of PPE and infection prevention and control. So there'll be no risk to other facilities. And some of the residents in another part of the Rosewood um, facility are still being cared for there with, again, good infection prevention control in place. Some have moved to other, other rest home residences though, haven't they? from the Rosewood facility? Uh, yes, but not from the part that had the in infection, is my understanding. Have they, not been, have they been tested, or are you confident that they uh, have been exposed to the virus? Uh, I can't say if they've been tested. They, would have been, they wouldn't have been moved if there was any suggestion they had either been exposed or that if they were a possible or a suspected case. Look, thank you very much again. Thanks for coming out on Easter Sunday, and uh, we'll look forward to continuing to work with you. Kia ora koutou.